Thank you. Yeah, so I won't really be talking about pirates, um, and I won't try to make any awkward jokes about pirates and hiding keys and so on. Um, I'm going to do a much more uh, talk about a much smaller space of this in a way, just to, uh, around like how do you actually handle authentication with this uh, architecture, and um, and I'm going to talk more about like the, the architectural part, not so much of what you think about maybe as as, as static sites. Um, because I'm not going to talk about like brochures and so on, but but an actual like living project built with an architecture where all the front end is is, is built out statically and, and can live directly on a content delivery network. So uh, before I start talking a lot about authentication, I'll just uh, tell you who I am. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm I'm the co-founder and CEO of of Netlify, and um, for those of you that that didn't already look up Netlify during Brian's talk or, <laughs> or before we came here. Um, what we're doing at, at, at Netlify is building a, a publishing platform for the modern web. So we're sort of looking at, at, at this architectural shift in, in how the web is built around um, moving from these traditional monolithic applications where everything talks to a database every time someone visits and, and to a decoupled architecture where we can separate what's front end from what services. And then building a coherent and unifying platform around that so so you as developers can can, can focus on just building your front ends and your microservices and not on, on, on running all the infrastructure to tie it all together. Um, so as I mentioned, what I'm going to talk about today is not really like just um, traditional uh, static sites in the sense of like you, you, you have some folders and you push them somewhere and then people go and view the, the, the HTML files in, in those folders. Brian talked about this, this evolution of the web and the way we've sort of, in a certain way, returned to a place we came from, but, but also with a, with a more powerful architecture that we like to talk about of the Jamstack, where Jam stands for JavaScript APIs and markup, simply because you you come to a place where you decouple the front end and the back end, you ship markup, typically to a content delivery network, and then you run JavaScript as runtime directly in the browser and talk to all these different APIs and microservices. And that's sort of a different way of, of, of thinking about the modern web architecture. Um, this is sort of a summing up of, of some of the things Brian, uh, Brian talked about, right? Where way before the web, we had this traditional client-server model in, in, the, in the world of Unix. That was sort of very, very simple, right? You, you ran your client on your local workstation, and then you logged into a, a Unix server, and there was an open connection, and you sent information back and forth. Um, then the, the, the web happened. Um, and, and we moved to a different kind of, of, of interaction where the browser originally was a very lightweight sort of document reader that would then talk to a web server, that would talk to some application server, that would run a program, that would talk to a database, that would send data back to the application server, that would then stitch together HTML pages on the fly and then send them back to the web server that would send them back to the browser every time someone visited. Um, which was like a, a pretty amazing invention at the time, right? Like it, it, it enabled us to do a lot of things that the browser couldn't handle otherwise. But it was also like a very complicated system and it requires like as the web evolved and got bigger and more people got on it, it required us to insert all these layers of caching in between and, and all these different scaling techniques to actually be able to, to keep up with, with, with this. It also introduced all these security issues that that Brian already mentioned that, that since you have a running program, every time there's an interaction, people can do things you didn't think about to that program and end up doing things to your database that you really don't want them to do. Um, now we're starting to see the shift from, to, from, from this kind of architecture to an architecture where the browser has become way more powerful, right? Like the, the Chrome team has done a, a, a big part of that, but uh, even like starting back with when Opera launched and finally started to, to make some alternative to Internet Explorer, we've gone from a place where the browser was really just this document viewer to, to, to a place where the browser is, is almost an operating system, right? So what you, what you see now is that on the initial load, the browser will fetch 
a front end directly from a content delivery network with very low latency. And then instead of, in, instead of talking to like a specific server or a specific like being a client server model, we start having this model where, where, the, where the browser just talks to all these different microservices where some of them might be some you control and some of them might be services like Discuss or Facebook comments or whatever. Um, so that brings us to, to sort of the question Jessica was asking. When, when, we, when we start having this architecture and our whole front end, our whole client lives directly on a content delivery network and just gets loaded up in, in the browser, where do we handle authentication and how do we handle the, the, the stuff that we can't put in the client because it's kind of secret, right? And, and uh, we, we need people to, to interact before we can show it to them. So um, if we go back to the Unix model, and I'm going to just speak in very general terms here, right? Like not, not, not go into details, but, but if we look at, at how it worked way back then with the client server model, it was, it was very simple because it was a stateful protocol, right? So when, when you wanted to, to log into a Unix server, you essentially just send a username and a password with a connection request, and the server would look at a, at a file with credentials and see is this guy someone who should have access to my server. And then um, if that was the case, open up an authenticated session, and then everything that went on over that session or that socket was sort of like you, you could know that, that that person was locked in, and you would keep an in-memory like object to track that user and, and to keep to keep track of everybody that, that, that's on the server right now. So it was the server's responsibility to keep that state, and that, that made it fairly easy from, from, for the client. Um, when, we, when we moved to sort of the web uh, method, especially with the very document-oriented browser, uh, that was also a move to, to HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol. And the whole idea by, behind HTTP is, was, was Roy Fielding's idea of representational state transfer, or REST as we come to know it uh, today, right? Where, where the protocol were no longer stateful. So you never, never opened a connection to a server that would have to keep track of all the connections that were there and, and keep track of like who, who has, who's authenticated right now and what is this con connection authenticated with. Instead, every single request was, was carried its own state and, and would get its own responses in independently. And so that, that changed a lot how we would think about authentication and, and how we would handle it. And um, I'm sure how, how many here have, have implemented um, an authentication library for sort of a traditional stack like Rails or PHP or anything like that? Yeah, and you've, you've all seen this typical flow where you have some kind of login page, the user will go to that login page, submit some form with a username and a password to the server. The server then looks up the user in the database and hopefully controls if that user should have any, any permissions. Um, if the user is authenticated, you typically create a session in that database with an ID and then send back that session ID in a cookie to as part of the response. And that was sort of the main stateful uh, functionality of the browser, where now the client would keep track of that cookie and start sending that cookie with every single request that got sent to the server afterwards. Um, the server could then, on every single request, look up that session in the database, check, like, do we actually have a session that corresponds to this cookie? If we do, then check if the permissions is right and everything, and then, sent back a response that, that, that matches this. Um, it, it, has, it, it, it delegated this stateful tracking to, to the client in a way, but, but at a level where you don't really, at a developer, had a lot of control over it. You, you basically just got told by the server, now start sending this cookie, and, and the browser would do that. You, you, didn't have any, you didn't have much control of inspecting it and controlling it, and that, that in itself has led to a bunch of security issues around um, around session hijacks and so on, because if someone else sends a post, like puts up a form that submits to your server, the browser will also send the user's cookie with that form request, so then you need to start keeping track of, of forg forgery request IDs and so on. 
Um, but anyway, th this was like the typical way that authentication would work. Now, when we move to this new model of, of no longer having a client and a server, and no longer having this monolithic application that, that serves every time, that builds every time thing every time you visit it, what do we do about authentication and where does it live and, and how do we keep it safe? So before we go into that, let me dive in a little uh, to sort of the more typical single page app approach where, where you're already starting to decouple the front end and the back end. You're saying, okay, we have a front end maybe made in, in React or in Ember or something like that. We put it on a CDN and it mainly talks to one API. Um, now, whenever we talk to that API, this is sort of the, the typical pattern, right? Like we sent some kind of HTTP request uh, and we set an authorization header with an access token. Um, and then the API will do some logic. It will typically do exactly the same as our own monolithic app did. It will look at that access token as if it's kind of a session ID, look it up in the database, see if you have permissions, um, check the token, and send back a, a response. But that leaves us with, with the question of how do we get an, an access token into our client? Like we've loaded this client from, from the CDN. There's no logic involved. We need to get some kind of access token. We can obviously not... We can actually not put this access token in our front end code because then everybody has the same access token. And we can't really put any kind of secrets or anything like that in our front end code because then they're no longer secret. So how do we actually get an access token that we can use to talk to our API? The, the, the standard that emerged after several attempts, uh, that's why it's called OAuth 2, um, there was a couple of tries, and, and there could still be more, but right now this is like the best standard that emerged for this kind of, of, of um, flow around getting an access token for an API, right, was, was OAuth. Um, and the OAuth solution came with a, with a number of different, in, in the spec, a number of different ways of achieving this magical access token. The, the most straightforward one is maybe the resource owner password credentials that I'll show in a moment. There's an implicit grant way that's very handy because it doesn't require you to keep any secret anywhere, um, but it's not that supported. And then there's the author authorization code flow, which requires you to, to think about where you keep your secrets, and I'll go into all of these. So the resource owner password it's really handy if, if, you, if you control both the API and the client. And, and what happens with the resource owner password, all of, these, all of these grant methods is about saying, like, how do I get an access token that represents a specific user? So I don't want like an access token that's mine, that's everybody's access token. I want some user to say, like, I give you right to access this API and do it on my behalf. And the very simplest way is simply to ask that user, hey, give me your username and your password, and I'll send that to the API, and then the API can, can, can do that typical dance of looking up the user in, in the database and checking if the hash password matches and say, okay, here you go, and send back an access token. And that's actually part of the, the, the OAuth 2 standard, and it's very similar to how you would do a form-based um, grant. You simply send a URL encoded the, the username and the password to the server, uh, and the server will then reply back with an access token if it's valid. The problem with this is that you can only, you should only ever use it essentially if you built the API, because you'll never ever want to ask people to give you the, their username and password for, for some other API, right? Like you would never want to say, hey, give me your username and your password for Google if you're not Google, right? Like it's, it's, it's both something that most users will wisely deny you, and it's also a really bad thing to train users to think they should allow you to ever get someone else's password, right? So, so this can work if you built the API yourself, but not if it's someone else's API. If it is someone else's API, and they support the implicit grant method. Then, then you can get away from the whole issue of, of thinking about secrets and so on. And instead, you can use the trust, uh, you can establish the trust between you and the API by way of the domain 
your API operates on and the specific URL you register when, um, when setting up your API client. So how many here has set up for some system and an OAuth client? Uh, yeah, so that's like really typical. If you want to do something with an API, if you want to do something with GitHub's API or Facebook's API or Google's API or Twitter API or Netlify's API, the first step is that you have to go and register an API client and see this is my app, it has some name, and you get a client ID and a client secret, and you typically also have to register a redirect URL. Now with the implicit grant type, the redirect URL is the most crucial part of this, because it tells, that, it tells Google, if you register with Google as an API client, you will be telling Google, whenever this API client with this client ID makes a request for authentication, you should never accept sending people anywhere else than to this URL, which is my website. And if you do that, and, and the API supports um, the, the implicit grant flow, then once your front end loads from the CDN, all you have to do is create a, a redirect. Essentially, you, you'll just, in your client, replace the, the document location with the API endpoint together with your client ID that, that lets Google know which, which application is this asking for permissions. Um, you'll set this response type to, um, to token and then specify your redirect URI. That sends your user. So if I'm your user and I go to your app and ask to be logged in, I get sent over to, in, in, in this imaginary case, over to, to some Google API where I will be asked to give your app permission. And then Google will look closely at the redirect UI and the redirect UI on file for that client ID and say, do I have permission to send this user back to that UI? And if it does, it'll send, you, send the user back and it will set a, a hash with an access token. It'll use the, the, the spec uses a, a, a fragment in the URL because that's part of the HTTP spec that the browser will never send that fragment to any servers or anything. So that, that's a way of trying to guarantee that this, that this secret access token doesn't end up in, in uh, server logs around the web and so on, but that it just stays in the browser. And if you ever use this implicit grant method, you should immediately, when people get redirected back, remove that from the URL fragment and just store it in local storage or in session storage or in memory, um, depending on the li lifetime you want to, to lock the user in for. Um, that's, the, that's the implicit grant and it gets completely around this whole problem of where do I store secrets. It can be used for completely from, from a pure front end app without any without any kind of server implement implementation. So in that way, it, it can be really powerful. Um, there are a few gotchas with it, like with everything powerful. Um, one of them is that the example I just showed has a security flaw, so don't do that. <laughs> um, the standard specifies that you should also use a state query parameter. So when you initiate that redirect, you should somehow create a, a unique ID that you store again, probably in session storage or in local storage. And when you get the request back with the access token, the, the, the API will return that state that you sent to it. And you should always make sure that these two match because otherwise people can, can do tricky things by sending people to that URL and over to your service. And you might not really be prepared for suddenly getting someone locked in that, it, that, that didn't expect that they were going to log in. And suddenly you can have with phishing flows where, where people end up in your app with permissions for Google and they don't know it. The other main thing is that it's not very widely supported by all providers. Google, Google supports them in some of their APIs, but GitHub, Twitter, like Facebook, most others don't never, never support this implicit grant flow. So that limits the use, which is a bit of a shame because it's, it's, it's so handy that you can really use these API without any sort of, with, without any sort of hidden database or, or any kind of secrets. And the, the last flow I'll go through here is the more typical authorization code flow. And this is where you do need to think about secrets. So the flow here is very similar in, in the beginning. Someone goes to your front end application, 
uh, they ask to you you ask them hey please let me get access to to this API on your behalf you create some redirect URL that again includes your client ID and uh, you set the response type you expect from, from the other end of this to, to code. And then you do a redirect. And again, if I go visit this site and it's a Google API, I get sent to Google, I get asked by Google, do you want to give application X access to your Google account with this scope? Uh, and in this case, when the request comes back to, to our example.com ac application, it has a query parameter with a code in it. And that code doesn't in itself give you access on behalf of the user, but you can exchange that code in by sending a, a request to the API. So in this case, we, we send a request, we, we take the code we just got from the query parameter, and, and we send a request to the API that will then return an ac this magic access token that we can now use to access the, the app on behalf of the, of, the, of the user. The problem here is that in order to send this request, we need to set that little uh, authorization header. Um, and that header we need to construct with a secret. So when I register my example.com application with Google, I, have to, I, I get a client ID and I get a secret. And to exchange this code for an access token, I need to, to sign my request with that secret. And we cannot do that in the front end because we can't give the secret to the front end. It, it's, as soon as we give it to the front end, it's no longer a secret. So that's, that's where you will need some kind of uh, authentication service simply to do this little part of signing your secret request. So there's a few open source solutions out there, and at Netlify we have a concept called of authorization providers that for specific APIs will do just this little step of, of signing the secret for you. But it's, it's like one of these small parts where you can do almost everything just in the front end. But, but to sign these requests, you need some kind of server that, that, that knows your secret and, and can share it. Now. Now, with this single page app approach, in the end, as I said, like the, the final flow ends up reminding us a lot of the, of the typical monolithic app, right? We, we end up with this magical access token. We request something from a server. We do a look that, that will look up our session in the database, and hopefully it's right session. And then instead of responding with HTML, it'll send us back some, some JSON. And, and it's not so different. But that brings us back to the, to the next request. What, what happens when we don't have a single page app that talks to one API? But when you have this modern Jamstack approach with, with, with sort of a hybrid of content and everything that talks to all these different microservices, where do we get, how, how do we talk to these different services? How do we make sure they all understand who the user talking to them are and that we don't have to ask the user to authenticate with every one of them every time he wants to do anything? So with the single page app, this was like really simple, right? With the Jamstack, we have this concept of all these different APIs. And, and how, do we, how do we actually authenticate with them? The really naive approach that, that I've seen built before and, and that's been done is, is to have all these API be aware of some authentication API. And then you can send your token to them. And then each of these APIs will talk to the authentication API. And you end up with a very tight coupling. Like all of these APIs need to be aware of each other. And they need to know about this specific authentication service that can re return the user information. Um, you end up with this single point of failure where if your authentication service is down, then all your APIs stops working. And it's also not super good for, for performance. At best, it's similar to having a database that you talk to on every single request. And at worst, at, at worst it's, it's even worse because of the HTTP overhead and so on. So how do we get away from that? Well, one of the really cool solutions to this is, is the idea of JVT, so JSON Web Tokens. JSON Web Tokens is, uh, is a web standard that got published by the people behind the Auth0 
Auth0 in itself is, is an authentication API. So it's like one of the pieces of this Jamstack puzzle where it's one of all these APIs that, that you can talk to. Um, what Auth0 essentially does is issuing these JSON web tokens. So what is a JSON web token? A JSON web token is, is very unmysteriously just a string. Uh, so that might seem boring. Uh, it's a string that has three different parts. It has a header, it has a payload, and it has a signature. Uh, and it's signed with a secret uh, and can be verified. So what that means is that th this is like an, a, a typical example of a JSON web token. The red part here is a header. There's a little dot separating it from that part, which is the payload. And then the last part is, is a signature. Now, what this means is that if you decode this, if you take it and, and, and run it through, run each part through a base64 decoder, you will, you will end up getting something like this, where the header becomes a little JSON object that specify an algorithm and a type, where the payload becomes a JSON object that can actually have any set of key value pairs in it. It's just a, 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 a JSON object. And the signature in itself is, is composed of a base64 encoded version of the header, a base64 encoded version of the payload, uh, concatenated with a secret, and then run through the, um, the algorithm specified in the header. So, so it's cryptographically signed. Now, what that means is that this token can, can include claims in the payload. So there's a list, if you go to the specification I linked earlier, there's a list of, of claims that has specific meaning. And one of them is the sub claim, that's the subscriber or the specific user. So you can look at that claim and say, this is the user ID of, of whoever this JSON web token is issued to. It can also authorize the user uh, and, and work as a way of building trust. And that's because it has this signature. So if you have the same secret, if you know the secret that the service that issues the JSON web token used, whether it's Auth0 or whether it's an open source authentication API or your own system, if you know the same secret in an API and you get a JSON web token, you can use that secret to verify that the signature really matches the, the header and the payload. And then you can trust all the information in the claims. So that means that suddenly this JSON web token can in include information that might say this user is, an, is a super admin. And just by verifying the signature, your service will know, oh, this user is a super admin because the JSON web token he sent me says so. Um, the token can also include display data. So for example, if you have a little API for generating orders in an e-commerce and you send it a request that has a signed JSON web token that it understands, maybe that JSON web token has a, a full name in the JSON payload. And now that that little microservice can create a new order and then send an invoice to the user that includes the full name. And it can know that, that this is really the full name of the user you, 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 you just sent. So what these little strings mean, and it seems like a little detail that we just like, instead of returning some generic access token from our OAuth flow, suddenly we, we can return one of these JSON web tokens and we can use them to get around this dependency on some kind of authentication service that all our APIs need to know about. And instead we can move to a, to a model where we talk to some a, a authentication API that can issue these JSON web tokens. And then as long as all these small microservices we otherwise talk to understands JSON web token as a, as a concept and knows the secret that we use to generate the token with, they, they can all just trust that the information in that token identifies the user, that it identifies what permission the user has and, and, and work with that. So that, that means that we go from a model we had before that depended on a database to a model here where we just send a request with a JSON web token. 
the API will just verify the signature and the claims. It doesn't need to talk to any database or anything. It's completely stateless. And it will send back some, some JSON that, that matches the permissions the user has and the ID the user has and any display data about the user. So that's all really nice, except when we don't have any way to tell these APIs we're talking to our secret and when they don't know about JSON Web Tokens and they're not our APIs, so we can't just go and fix it. What do we do then? So this is where we start having a concept of API gateways. And there's a couple of, uh, Kong is a super, uh, super interesting open source API gateway made by the team behind Mashape, built with Nginx. Uh, at Netlify, we have a super micro API gateway called Gotiator, written in Go, it's open source, uh, and, and it's just very simple uh, mini API gateway. And AWS re recently launched their API gateway, and it's, it's starting to become a pretty common service from a lot of providers. What happens here is that, let's say we want to, to talk to, these, to, to an API, and we've set up an access token on our behalf so, so we can talk to that API, we can sign requests. We obviously can't share our, as I said in the beginning, we can't share our access token with the front end because then we're suddenly giving it to everybody and, and everybody can talk to the API on our behalf and we're not interested in that. But we do want to allow users that have specific permissions in our system to talk to this API and, and make changes on our behalf. Now, we can sign our requests, like we can, we can generate some JSON web token for our user we have our authentication service that, that generates a request and includes some claims on what, what permissions should this user has. And maybe that claim say that this user has certain permissions against Google's API. Now instead of talking directly to Google's API, we talk to a little API gateway that sits in between, that looks at that JSON web token, verifies the signature and sees, okay, this user has a permission to send this request to this API. And then just proxies the request to the API, but signs it with your access token, which is now completely hidden from, from, from the front end side. The API replies back and the gateway just transparently proxies it through. And now suddenly you have this connection to an API that you didn't control, that you didn't build, but that's completely stateless and, and that doesn't need to know about your permission levels or, uh, or, or your system. And uh, that was uh, my fairly dry attempt at, at explaining uh, how secrets and authentication uh, and API permissions work in this kind of uh, Jamstack approach to building modern websites.